Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavner here on TRSI. I'm here today with my friend and colleague Michael Dwyer. Michael, how have you been since last week? I've been tolerably well, Gary. Thank you very much. And how are you? I'm surprised you've been tolerably well, Michael, because it's been a real shit show of a week for democracy. It has been a shit show, and there is no other suitable way of describing it. But it is, as Shakespeare said, an absolute fucking shit show for democracy in Ireland. There you go. We had the Safe Access Zones, a bill which allows the state to designate areas of the country and say that not only can people not speak in those areas without potentially being arrested, but that the government can pick the topics that the people can't discuss in those areas, passed by a majority, I believe, of roughly 100 votes. Because obviously, Michael, given that that is aimed at abortion, there's absolutely no risk of accepting the precedent that the state can do that. And that bill could never be repurposed for other uses once it's accepted. Oh, never, ever. I mean, you couldn't have people discussing in the same week as they passed this by the kind of vote that you'd normally see in places like North Korea, discussing creating a safety cordon around the Leinster House and making sure that you could you had to stay within one point one point six kilometers of safety. You couldn't conceivably see a situation where they'd say, well, you know, obviously uh, this is about making people feel safe, Gary, and protecting people from intimidation. And there may be other situations where, for example, you need to feed people to feel safe and to be free from intimidation. Because what it is, Gary, it's about hate. There are hateful people out there who are going around hating and inciting hate and spreading hate. And we have to stop that. We have to clamp down on the hate. So, for example, I don't see, morally speaking, what the difference is. In fact, I can see that it could be even worse if you had, say, a refugee reception center or an asylum, a place where asylum seekers were living, and you had people protesting outside there hating in a way, in that kind of hateful way that people hate. And people might feel unsafe, Gary, and hurt and insulted. And I think actually briefly for a moment being serious, in a a demonstrably more serious and more genuine way than anything we have seen up to now regarding people standing silently outside hospitals in Ireland or praying the rosary. And I think if, if you're going to talk about protecting people from intimidation and making people feel safe, well, why wouldn't you put it in there, Gary? Or is it that we don't really care about these people because they're foreigners? Is it? Are you saying, Gary, that this government is racist? Is that what you're saying? Or, Michael, I mean, you could have a situation where, let's say, uh, there's a strike against a business. And yeah. we all, Michael, must respect the right of people to strike. But we've got to you know, accept that sometimes that crosses the line into an intimidation tactic, Michael. And in those cases, I think we would, you know, perhaps use legislation like this to just move those people away from, you know, their places of work in the interest of public safety. Well, for example, that's a very good one, Gary, because for example, say you decided that because your workers weren't working, you were going to go and source workers from somewhere else, like maybe Bulgaria, where you have very good workers, and you're going to bring them in. But you had the people who were annoyed by this, and they were being very angry and shaking their fists and shouting things and making people feel unsafe. It might be a very good idea in situations like that to say, no, you're gonna, we're not going to allow you to be in this space. You can go on strike and protest, but you can't make the new workers feel unsafe. So you're going to have to stand over there. I think that would be a very sensible policy. So, uh, yeah, you know, I can see that. I can see that. And of course, Michael, you know, the same could be said for protests inside TD's clinics. Oh, God, yes. Or uh, TD's anything, Gary. TD's clinics, TD's houses, TD's hairdressers or barbers, TD's tattoo parlors, TD's churches. Anywhere where TD or a senator or a senator, I think that they should be. I mean, we live in a democracy, Gary. We have to do, we have to protect democracy from these people who want to bring down democracy by protesting at it. Mm-hmm. And not the people voting for these oh, bills. no, 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 no. <laughs> Now you're just being provocative, Gary. No. I, well, I mean, Michael, at least we do have the the uh, strong safety of our NGO friends. I mean, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, for instance, has been exceptionally supportive of this bill, which we should take as a sign that there are no concerns at all with the bill. And rest easy knowing that if the government try and push beyond this, the ICCL will make some sort of principle stand that will only be slightly undercut by their total support for it in principle. In principle and in private. And in private. <laughs> and in lobbying to TDs. Yeah. And in nearly every interaction they could humanly fit in. There has to be a little bit of a public facing bit where you say, oh no, civil liberties, free speech. Yeah, yeah, worried, worried. But then you go away and you do your business. 
I mean, we had a talk all last week, Michael, about that uh, protest outside the dawn. That was an assault on democracy. And then we immediately passed this by a margin <laughs> of a hundred uh, over. This is a, an atrocious. It's it's horrendous. It can have you arrested for simply silently being in an area if you are thinking the wrong things. It hasn't worked well anywhere it's been tried, and it's an affront to democracy. And yes, the concern is that the principle once accepted will spread, which, again, shockingly does not seem to be a concern to any of the NGOs who are meant to be concerned with civil liberties. And I am I'm legitimately, legitimately curious what their internal thought process is here. Is it that this will never go anywhere else, that this will never apply to any other area? And, you know, abortion is one of those issues where we're fine with it happening. Well, I think there are a couple of things. The first thing is, I think that anything which dampens down or limits the capacity of people to a protest about abortion is simply a good thing. Because we have the speed at which we have gone from a very restrictive regime to basically, you know, whatever you want, lads. And it's just healthcare. It's just, it's just like your appendix. It's just healthcare. That has been, I mean, ad, the speed has been admirable. So anything that takes, that but Gary, do you remember we were talking about this a few weeks ago? If you're really was a, a, a prominent left wing academic was wasn't he on RTE? He was being interviewed and uh, dismissed concerns. Said, the police would never use powers in this in, in an, any kind of an abusive or excessive fashion. Do you remember? Yes, yes, he made. I sent him a number of questions, none of which he ever responded to. Um, about that, but yes, his, his argument, I believe he was a sociology professor, was that we didn't have to worry because the police and judiciary would, would act in a manner totally above reproach, which is an odd line for a sociology professor to say. A lefty sociology professor coming out and basically, oh, in Ireland, our judiciary and our police are just above reproach and they would never do that kind of thing. This is just kind of, oh, the usual scare tactics from the right. No, there was a a deep and beautiful comedy to that, Gary, the idea of a left-wing sociology. It's hard to imagine that somewhere in the late 60s in France, he would have been quite the same tune. You know, remember there was that beautiful piece of graffiti, which was very popular with the uh, the left, which was, there is a policeman inside every one of us. We must kill him. <laughs> we have, the tune has changed. The music has changed. But then again, maybe that's because the police have changed or the sociology professors have changed. I don't know. But something has definitely judged. There is part of me that is legitimately deeply surprised with how a bill like this, which is offensive to the concept of democracy, I would say. It may, by the way, be on the the words of the Taoiseach. Uh, it may also be offensive to the face of the Constitution, but they don't seem to... They have enacted nothing. Not, and since he said that, they, they haven't done anything to... Uh, to remedy whatever the constitutional pro- problems might be, well, if there are any, but yeah. But yes, democracy, Gary, it is. Yeah, but the mere packaging of this as something which will only target uh, pro-life protesters and prayer vigils has somehow made people who, in I think any other circumstance, would look at this and realise how dangerous and corrosive this is and would immediately recognise that. But the mere fact it's now about abortion seems to have totally blinded them to that fact. And that's kind of worrying because presumably if you are if you're involved in the fight for civil liberties and you are committed to fighting for those principles, a repackaging of something like this should not be enough to convince you it's a good thing. Unless you are, Michael, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, not terribly bright. <laughs> you, but you don't mean that in an insulting way. No, well, I mean, Michael, if, if they weren't, if that was not to be true, you'd have to find some other explanation for that. And I'm not sure you'd find an explanation that would be less insulting. That is also true. But when you're talking about the about the speed this has gone, we've gone from safe, legal, but rare to if you are sitting or if you are standing in the wrong part of the city and thinking the wrong thoughts about this in a fashion which is not supportive of it, we can arrest you in six years. Uh, yeah, it is. It's 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 it is pretty good. It's pretty dramatic. But will the question the question is will, will they be able to actually, of course, because and that's one of the problems. That the whole thing is kind of badly phrased and kindly vague. Will you will they be able to get you for on on suspicion of thinking the wrong thing? I mean, originally, originally, if you were caught looking at the building, 
there was a possibility they could catch you for looking at the building. Not, let's not over it. I think now you have to be actually car- Do you not have to be carrying some kind of literature? Oh no, no. But if you're carrying some kind of literature, that that's right out, right to jail. <laughs> right to jail. Your thoughts are going to be a little bit harder for them to prove. Uh, and yes, the. the <laughs> The draft of the bill which Sinn Féin were pushing, which was if you look at a building in a way that's not entirely supportive of the choices of those inside it, you can be arrested, was pretty out there. Um, again, some not terribly smart decisions. I think there is an element, Michael, of this, of we're just going to do it. And if there are constitutional issues, well, someone has to bring a case. And not only does someone have to bring a case, but someone who is sane and well-resourced needs to bring a case because some nutter bringing a case is actually very advantageous because you will likely lose because you will argue badly. Uh, we talked about this, I think, multiple times, Michael, the problem with the um, with the rule of law in Ireland. And we saw this during COVID as well. Uh, if you want to defend your rights, it is outside the reach of massive amounts of the citizenry because it requires so much money. So if you are someone who this act uh, breaches the rights of, most people are not going to be able to do anything to remedy that, even if it is impacting large amounts of people, because bringing a case against this is likely going to cost hundreds of thousands of euro. You have to be a person that has the money. You're going to have to be a person that has the standing. You're going to have to be a person, if you want to win it, who isn't a lunatic. Uh, it, the, 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 the requirements are going, to be, are going to be... But, Gary, is this not true of a lot of a lot of Irish law. I mean, if we've talked about this before, and I certainly opined it to, to you and to others privately, that if you look at Irish defamation law, the thing about the Irish defamation law is you can defame someone if you're poor because you're judgment proof. And you you and you can def and you can defame someone who is poor because they can't sue you. But defaming someone who is wealthy are not even defaming them, actually. Telling some writing a, a, a negative story Without who without a wealthy person is a very dangerous thing because unless you have massive resources, the threat of the high court and the potential because you'd never know, you never know what the libel case or defamation case, you never know what the outcome is going to be. So there are people that you and I know who have a regular at any one time a regular a set of defamation suits simmering away on the back burner and bringing in a nice income because they know after years and years of doing this, that they're never actually going to have to pursue the case because they have the resources. But for example, if one of the same people was to defame you or I, we there's no way, barring, no, barring we won the lottery because nobody else can, can come along and help us out and fund our defamation case for us. The wider point, you, you know, if you're going to go to law and Ireland, bring money in, and if you can't, if you if you're not going to bring a gun. So, uh, also, how many people voted against? I mean, it, I think it hit a hundred, didn't it? It was over a hundred. It was over a hundred. Uh, I don't have the figures in front of me, but I think it was a hundred and fourteen somewhere in that region. With, if I recall correctly, ten votes against and over thirty uh, not presents. I, I I I'm sure I've probably said this before, Gary, but. I, for anybody who's in doubt, just to think about the way this legislation is, you can have exactly the same people standing in exactly the same place, behaving in exactly the same way, holding placards. And I say a placard, holding a sign of any kind, just a, a, it could be an A4 sheet. And on one A4 sheet is written something to do with the management of the hospital or the state of the government or the, the polar bears. And another, it says, um, we are pro-life. By the simple act of changing the letters on that piece of paper, you go from being doing somebody who's being legal to legal. And, and you might say, well, of course, that's the whole point of it. Well, my, my point is simply this. That, that makes it absolutely clear and explicit. What you're doing is the government is specifically targeting one political view, one political belief, and making it criminal. Ultimately, the behaviour is the same, the noise is the same, the presence is the same, the people are the same. It's the only thing that criminalises the act is the belief. And for anybody, even who people who, who would like to see abortion on demand up to 40 weeks, they should be concerned, if they're concerned about democracy, they should be concerned about that. And as you said before, Gary, if you don't believe this can be repurposed, you're a very innocent man. Moving on, Michael, from this sort of broad assault on democratic rights to 
somewhat of a, a narrower attack on democratic rights from our dear minister Catherine Martin. Yeah, this was this was a this was really creepy, creepy, scary stuff. Here, here is what happened here. Last week, there was a meeting in the National uh, Boxing Stadium. It was held by a group called Christian Voices Ireland. It was about the SBHE yeah. um, curriculum and about parental concerns with uh, what children are being taught by parents. Now, Christian Voices Ireland is a evangelical group. They make no um, apologies for that. It was an explicitly religious event. Yeah. Um, although touching on you know a secular educational matter. People were very unhappy with this. Now, this is not the first time that Christian Voices Ireland has had something in the National Boxing Stadium. I think they regularly hold meetings there because the evangelical groups in Ireland are very excised about this duty, as are a lot of the Muslim groups, actually. So I'm told there were quite a lot of Muslims in attendance at this on that basis. So there's kind of a, a, a pluralistic, Michael, should we say, response to this curriculum. Diversity. There was a lot of considerable diversity to the, to the people in the room. It's actually a considerable problem for those who are against them because the evangelicals are so diverse. Yes. Uh, there are so many African and South American evangelicals that it's very hard if they talk about things like immigration or, or things of this nature to go to the old standard of far-right racists because you're likely saying that to someone who is from Africa. Which is not... The NGOs are bad, but they, they haven't quite gotten to that level yet. <laughs> They're getting there, though. There will come a time. Um, but people started complaining to the stadium. Now, I'm told no boxing clubs complain to the stadium, which is deeply unsurprising, as people may not be aware of this. But evangelical groups are a lot of the, the backbone of boxing in this country, which is why a lot of our boxers are actually evangelicals. They just don't say that... Um, terribly loudly. But uh, evangelicals are very strong in the kind of working class areas that boxing has traditionally come from. So that's really unsurprising, but important for this. So complaints were coming into the stadium. The stadium didn't seem terribly concerned about them. But then Minister Martin was asked what she thought about it, about the uh, about the usage of the stadium by Christian Voices Ireland. And the athletic uh, the the stadium had come out and said that they were going to look at this, look at their you know, what had come in, a standard boilerplate response with probably nothing behind it. But then she came out and said that she welcomed that um, that investigation. And the problem here, Michael, is and I'll, I'll give this to Catherine Martin. She was asked about this, and Catherine Martin is not good on her feet. A minister and the minister over the area of sports, and therefore the minister over the provision of public funding to the stadium, yeah. coming out and supporting an investigation into a religious organisation holding an event is not good, to put it bluntly. And I know that this has had an impact on the investigation by the stadium, that they are now treating it far more seriously because they think it's an object of interest to the minister who oversees their funding. Yeah, and it's become a, a serious concern for them rather than being just something which they were going to go through pro forma. And if it's a serious concern for them, like we can extrapolate, Gary, that there are an awful lot of places all around the country who are now paying very close attention to this. Here's a question. I mean, it's not a question you can possibly know the answer to, but of the various boxing clubs, snooker clubs, tennis clubs, theatres, GA stadia, whatever, around the country. How many have not received or do not receive any money at all, either from local or national government? To be honest, I wouldn't know. Well, no, you couldn't know, Gary. But wouldn't you have the sense that there are not that many? At this stage in Ireland, I mean, you, directly or indirectly, if you're going to be, you're, you're building something, you're doing something, which is a community-based project, at some stage you're going to get some money from the, the local district or from the county council or from the state or from the national lottery or somebody's going to give you money from somewhere. And anybody who's anybody who's in receipt of money is going to be paying very close attention to this. I think this is a disgraceful intervention. But, um, when she was asked about it, she said that the stadium hadn't been aware of the exact use of the stadium for the event. And I'm glad that they have said that they keep a much closer eye on their leasing arrangements. I think that is welcome. Now, that is being presented in the media as the minister welcoming the uh, investigation, the probe, into the usage of the stadium by Christian Voices Ireland. 
Technically, Michael, I suppose it's a gentler statement than is generally being reported. Gentler? You could, you could, I, I think you're being very kind, Gary, frankly. And that's what we do on this show, Michael. Yeah, kindness is our hallmark. We are known for it. I think it's actually slightly more gentle. What you're saying is they, that they need to be paying more attention, not just to this issue, but in future to all further people who are going to apply and see what they are going to be doing. I mean, why? I think that's a perfectly fair reading of it, Michael. But I would just say again that Catherine Martin is not great when speaking. And she hasn't had any time to clarify the statement since then. I think you may not want to clarify the statement ah, since then. I think you may be right, Gary. I think that Irish media, particularly the journal, may have a particular stance on this, Michael, even though their pieces are clearly marked as news, not comment. No, yeah, no, no comment in the journal, Gary. Everything scrupulously fact checked, fact checked to death. I heard the um, I heard the journal's fact checking referred to as quantum fact checking the other day. <laughs> I quite like it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Still, I'm, I'm still their high point is that um, transgender athlete in the uh, the cycling race where they claimed it wasn't a race yeah. because it was a ride instead because there were no prizes and said that they talked to the organiser and he had said that it was a ride, not a race. And when we got back and said, well, yes, but it called itself a race multiple times on its own website. They just said, yeah, we're not considering that. Yeah, it, and, and had very clear orders and rankings of who was, who was, I mean, what, who was coming first in the ride? How? Would- yeah, they, they, they had, um, they were like, oh, there were no male and female categories. And when we got back and said, well, here are male and female categories on the scoreboard, their response was, well, there's also a category for the car. So are we suggesting that the car is in the race? <laughs> it's like, a, I'm not sure if that's a serious point. No, I, at the you, you kind of started getting the feeling at the end of the, this was somebody who was, had decided the best uh, the best line of defense was not attack, but just comic absurdity. Uh, wasn't taking the whole thing terribly seriously. But on, on your point about the, 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 the idea of the Minister for Pork coming out and saying that it's not this group, it's leasing arrangements in general for groups of these sorts. That's a bit of a problem. Um, because, as I said, that is I know that is how the stadium is taking this. As a comment from the person who controls their funding as to the appropriateness of who they allow to use their building. When I asked her, and you might have, you might have said unkindly, uh, well, had she not had opportunity to clarify her statement since then? I'm actually... The, the question is actually a serious one. I think that in a situation like this, it is it behoves, Gary, the press, our journalists, our dear journalist friends out there, to go, and if it if they don't, then it, you're going to have to do it, and ask specifically, what are the guidelines? What are the principles that the minister feels should be involved here? Because I think in a situation like this, the problem is we leave them with the ambiguity. We let them away again and again with the ambiguity. And we don't let the people in the cheap seats know what the situation really is. Now, I'm not saying I'd be happy, but if Catherine Martin were to come out and, and to produce a set of 20 principles tomorrow that were going to be employed for whether or not where they're going to the, the state would continue to fund people who allowed uh, other people to use their facilities that they considered to be these 20 principles had to be obeyed and if otherwise you were a hate group or you were bigoted or you were not consonant with government policy or whatever it was that at least would provide everybody clarity and it would provide a target it would also provide an object which could be uh, brought to the courts for example it could be brought to the courts and Catherine Martin could be brought to the court of the couple of opinion when her, the election rolls around, and they could decapitate her, decapitate her uh, uh, electorally. I didn't. I did enjoy your statement that if no one else does it, then uh, you'll have to do it because you should have just left the start of that out. <laughs> we is... will. We will try and we will try and pin her down. The problem is the Catherine Martin. You know, she appears often, but she may not appear for a couple of weeks. Whereas uh, if she appears this week, yeah, we'll get her about this one. Well, we will I, I, see I think, exactly what the, uh, the the situation is, what what the uh, what the standards are here. I think it would be curi- I think it would be f- it would be nice if maybe a member of the uh, of the doll were to ask a question in the doll, looking for clarity on the subject. Members, many of 
their voters have been coming up to them and worried about this and demanding clarity? Obviously, Michael, we couldn't control something like that. No, we I wouldn't be surprised if that exact situation happens in a timely fashion. If someone listening to this happens to know it, or is a, re- a relative of a member of, of the Oireachtas, then maybe they could go and say to them, you know, this would be a, this would be a, 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 a fun thing to do. Because uh, they do this again and again, Gary, and we know that this is how it's going to operate with Say with the with the hate speech bill and with the and it will ha- it'll, and the exclusions on the thing again and again people will not behave because we allow them well, not we allow them because they succeed in living in ambiguity because the press in this country refuses to demand the kind of clarity that will collapse them because there's so many pieces of legislation and things that these people have done which they know if pushed to it you'll end up with a kind of a reductio ad, ad absurdum because they think they just will collapse into nonsense. But we live with the ambiguity and we let them wait. And there's too much ambiguity here. She needs to come out and explicitly say what can and can. So if, is it going to be acceptable for evangelical Christians or Orthodox Sunni or Shia Muslims or Orthodox Jews or, or even Orthodox Catholics to come and use a, a building to say something which is in consonant with their world view, consonant with their 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 morality and their metaphysics, but is deeply at odds with the world view outline of Catherine Martin or of the people who, for example, designed the uh, curriculum for the SPAG. Is that going to be a, is that a legitimate thing? Will they be allowed to do that? This even seems like the sort of thing, Michael, that you know. A group dedicated to the protection of civil liberties, such as the ICCL, might want to, you know comment on you don't you don't let you never let a chance go to give them one do you Gary no it's just Michael you know I was just I was wandering by their recent press releases and I just didn't see anything you know some might say that's because the ICCL couldn't find its own ass with both hands and a torchlight <laughs> I could find its ass but not its principles <laughs> that might be a fair point but some might ask Michael this would seem like the sort of thing where you know A minister coming out and seeming to support a notion that your religion should be taken into account before organizations rent you a hall? Yeah. That seems like the sort of thing. Like There might be a civil liberty implication there, Michael, or at least you might want to put out a statement going, well, you know, steady now. Like, let's not. Let's be careful with this. But I have found over the years, Michael, the ICCL is not... It's like a child who has no object permanence. The ICCL can't see anything more than one step away from them. <laughs> okay. I am the, the, one of my constant sources of low-level amusement is Liam Herrick, the uh, executive director of the ICCL, liking tweets shitting on Grit. <laughs> because we have published so much about their attempts and criticized them so heavily uh, that I think we've just broken them. And there's no longer this this attempt to appear above the fray no it's like get in the mud and roll in it and i I, you know i've got to admire that in them um yeah it turns out they don't like us very much at all Uh, but i would say michael i don't think we criticize them enough they are a pernicious harmful organization who seems really really fucking exercised by cameras on police but not on anything else and the rare moments where they do remember they have other jobs they seem to if anything make the situation worse which is actually kind of impressive in and of itself are you suggesting that a prominent, well-funded NGO could be having a negative impact on government policy and governance in the country? Yes, some might say that, Michael, but I couldn't possibly comment. I'll tell you who might say that. Charlie Flanagan. Charlie Flanagan. <laughs> yeah, you got there. I, I, Charlie Flanagan is an interesting case study on Irish political, and I say this in the nicest way possible, cowardice. We uh, the vote that just came up, Michael, on the um, the safe access sense. Yes, I know, and I assume you know as well. A number of the people who voted for that bill are deeply concerned with it. Some of them are pro life, others are not, and just recognise that the bill is obviously an issue. Yes, and they all voted for it. Now, some just didn't turn up, which is something, but also still not great because in Ireland it's very very unlikely that people will go against the whip. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil TDs do not like to do it. I mean, the Greens will just do it at will, but Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael don't. And then they will come to you and say, well, I had no choice. It was whipped. What was I meant to do? And the answer is usually, well, if you actually believed your principles or what you say are your principles, you should have voted against it 
and dealt with the consequences of it, whatever they were. But Charlie Fangan has come out and he's talking about the nature of politics in Ireland, how things have gone a certain direction, how on transgender, on hate speech, things are problematic. The problem, of course, Michael, is that, well, Charlie Fanagan, as Minister for Justice, attempted to bring in hate speech laws, and Charlie Flanagan, as a TD, voted for the Gender Recognition Act. And this is a common thing in Ireland. People doing things they don't believe, that they think are harmful. It's like American soldiers going to war, and then 10 years later, they'll produce a film telling that, yes, they killed all those people, but now they feel terribly sad about it. Very sad. And perhaps the solution may be just to not do that to begin with. But he has a wide-ranging interview in the Irish Times about the nature of politics, and none of it is, is terribly wrong. But again, it is not said when he actually had a chance to do anything about it. Bring in all the stuff and then come out and say, well, I was terribly sad bringing in all of the stuff that I will now admit is terrible. Okay, I, I, I take your point. Um, and I can remember one of the first conversations we had many years ago when we first met, talking about the problems or the, the, the weaknesses in the current Irish democracy. And me saying to you that, no, the, the, you had made a point and I said, yeah, that's fine. But the real problem is the fact that we have people in the doll who are not just voting for legislation they don't believe in. We have people in the doll who are framing legislation, which they actively believe will do harm rather than good, will not achieve what they're saying in public it will achieve. And in private, are, would actually, they were supporting uh, pieces of, leg they would actually support legislation which would do almost the exact opposite of it. And I, I remember you being, you were a little bit sceptical at the time. And as the years rolled by, you became less and less sceptical because of the proof of your faith. This is, the, it is true. We, we, we don't have a whip system like they have in England, where you have the first line, second line, and third line whip. And people will break a whip, which is one or two, but the third line whip tends to get them in. But because you have the graded whip system, it means that people have the opportunity at different times during the process of it, they have the opportunity to, 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 to vote against it or to, you know, deal with their conscience. Here, we really, we, they talk a lot of nonsense about conscience, but the truth is, I mean, the most obvious, famous in our little group anyway, uh, nonsense was when Alan Chatter voted against the, uh, voted against the government on the hair coursing issue. He wasn't expelled from the party, even though it was a whip vote, because it was a conscience issue. And then when Lucinda Crichton and et al. voted against uh, what they perceived again on an abortion, they were kicked out of the party because abortion isn't a conscience issue and hair coursing is. So, Gary, we let, we, let's not try and look for consistency or in coherency here. But... To say something nice about Charlie Gallagher, which is not something I've often done, he has at least said this while he is in the doll. There's, I know, I don't know dozens, but certainly over the years I've known many, many people who have left the doll or the shadow with the same beliefs that Charlie Flanagan has had and would actually be, I mean, Charlie is not a classic old-fashioned backwoodsman conservative religious pro-life filigaler. That is not Charlie Flanagan. Charlie Flanagan would be much, much more towards the centre of the progressive element of the party. And he has at least gone on record while a member of the government party, while still in the doll, and he has said this in a newspaper. And to be fair, it's not just today, Gary. He has been making comments like this for the last little while. He has been constantly sniping away in social media and on the traditional media talking about this. So... While we can regret what he has done in the past, we should at least welcome him to the party now and say, well, come in, Charlie. We're glad to have you. And some of the points that he makes really resonated with me. I mean, there was a line there I, I thought was interesting because it's not something that's talked about. Obviously. He said that he felt right now you have more influence as a middle ranking member of an, of some NGOs than you do as a backbencher of a government party. And I talked right. to, I talked to two, right. I talked to two TDs, one of whom has, was, was, 
was like one was talking about leaving. And one of the reasons, one of the big reasons they gave for leaving was their sense that they could achieve nothing. Now that Gary should be that should be a big fucking red flag when someone like Flanagan says he can influence government policy more as a middle-ranking member of an NGO than a member of parliament of the government party. Well, I, he is right in a way that supports, I think, a lot of what we've said about NGOs. But the only point I will put against ourselves there is this. Part of that is not that NGOs are so powerful. Part of that who is how little of a shit the major parties give about what their backbenchers think. I mean, there have been... It's never been... Backbenchers have never been the most influential people in any party. As a general rule, obviously, there are one or two who will have um, influence beyond what you would expect. But it seems to be getting worse and worse. The, the headquarters of both Fine Fáil and Fine Gael seem to be getting either stronger or at least more willing to make demands on certain things. Like Fine Fáil's head office in the last couple of years has been trying to control who certain TDs hire as parliamentary assistants. Yeah. That would not have happened during the time of O'Hearn because if he had tried, they would have, like, it would not have gone well. But now the pushback is much more muted and a lot of them have gone for it. And you're starting to see things like that. I don't think... We've complained a lot about how little quality there is in the doll at the minute. And I think it is. I think the standard of the doll is abysmal the last decade. But I think part of that is because knowing the backbenchers are becoming ever more marginal figures. Like they've gone from not terribly important to largely non-existent. Like occasionally I will see a um, a recording of the doll and I'll see someone and legitimately have no idea who they are. Yeah, that's yeah, it's true. I think it's true that M- Mount Street and HQs generally are far more overreaching and more powerful than they ever were. I think if you went back 20 years, certainly if you went back 40 years, the power of the local party was much bigger. You had a much larger cohort of volunteers who were personally attached to the local TD. Because I think funding, we've talked about this before, Gary, I think the single biggest pernicious thing that's happened to this, to that, in that way, to Irish politics was government funding, state funding of the political parties because they don't need the local parties anymore. They don't need the activists. They don't need the membership fees. They don't need the lottery tickets. They don't need to sell the raffle tickets. They don't need to do the church gate collections. All the things which I think are bad for at a macro level for politics because people are less and less exposed to the great unwashed and to the people in the cheap seats. But also it's meant that the power at the top end of the party has got greater and the before, I mean, this is if you look at the independents that we have in the Dáil, mostly they are from Fianna Fáil Jean Pool, what we call Jean, Jean, Fianna Fáil Jean Pool. Now, less so, actually. As time has gone on, that's becoming less and less true. But these tended to be people who had very strong local organisations, who fell out with the party and said, well, fuck yous, and ran themselves, and had the ability, because of their, their base, to get elected. That kind of thing, I think, is going to be harder and harder if you just simply to run off a base. Independents will be able to run, certainly, and be very successful, but I think they're going to be running off a local issue. It may be a, a policing issue or a hospital issue or a, 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 a some hot button, local hot button issue, like a, a schooling, whatever it is. But just the idea that one day a county councillor can pack up his bags and go off in a huff and just run because he has the party locally is getting harder and harder to imagine because the power has shifted so much towards Dublin along with the money. I mean, the backbenchers could, if they actually wanted, change a lot of things in the party, like the strength of the whip and things like that. They're not going to. No. Because they're backbenchers and they just won't. But they could. Finnegan and Finnefall members could absolutely change it but they won't but, because well, well it's, it's ambition as well i mean if you're if you're if you haven't been in government and you're a backbencher well then you're relying on patronage from above 
And then if you have been in government and now you're retiring to backbenches, you probably have, a, I mean, this is definitely true, there's a strong sense of loyalty to the party and to the leadership and that this is not what you do. You don't. It's always, loyalty to an organisation is always an interesting one to view. But it's particularly interesting, I think, in relation to Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, because loyalty to the, to the party you would have thought meant acting in the party's best interests. <laughs> but that's not how it's actually tended to work out for Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Things that have been deeply harmful to the parties that have happened both publicly and privately have been allowed to happen because of that loyalty, whereas you think actual legitimate loyalty would uh, sometimes involve making a difficult choice. But no, it never seems to in Ireland. Actually, on, um, on the topic of state funding and political parties... Just a little spoiler, I suppose. The EBI's next research paper is going to be an argument for the uh, public defunding of every political party in the country on the basis that it is harmful both to democracy uh, because it enshrines, um, it basically limits competition, but also to the parties themselves, that the public funding has warped the parties and made them separate from the people they claim to represent. I don't know if we've mentioned it. I'm sure we have adverted to it, but there's a book by Peter Barrett, the, uh, Mary, the Irish political scientist, called Ruling the Void. Myself and Gary have read it. We're both big fans. Now, Peter Mayer was a man of the left, very definitely. Not uh, not one of us. But I think as an analysis of this and the kind of thing that we're talking about in that putative paper, anybody out there, if you, I would highly recommend it. You, you, you enjoyed it, didn't you, Gary? It's a very good book. Um, it hasn't. It's it's getting up there in age at the minute, but it hasn't really dated. It's um, it uh, it actually works quite well. I think we've recommended it many times. But yes, it's, it's an excellent book. Um, and it's not about Ireland particularly, but uh, Peter Murrow was Irish and knew about Irish politics, so a lot of his examples are uh, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael. So it's actually quite uh, quite interesting in that one. Just before we finish on the, the, the Falangan story, I mean, there was another article that came out last week. We didn't talk about it. We didn't mention it. But uh, Don Loche, who was the former head of the adult gender clinic here in Ireland, he's now the lead on obesity. He is a endocrinologist uh, based, I think, in Lachlanstown, an extremely credentialed man. Now, I'm not talking about this, Gary, from the point of view of, I'm not adverting to it, around the, the specific issue of uh, trans uh, gender identity, etc. But rather, the point that he makes, that he, he raised again and again, he, he raised concerns about certain clinical aspects of the, the, of the uh, gender service, I think particularly for children, and was basically told that to shut up and not to be talking about that kind of thing in public. And his concern was that clinical decisions rather and the direction of decision-making within these services was being driven not by clinical advice or clinical expertise, but rather by advocacy groups. And my point is that that this is an example where we have an advocacy group, an NGO, an external group, Driving in an area where you might think it would have to be specific expertise at work, that you're talking about the the head, the head the two heads of the service. One was a professor of psychiatry, the other a professor of endocrinology. And you think, well, that's the people that's going to be driving policy in this area. But politically, that wasn't what was happening. I and mean, when you have that kind of reach of external bodies, of NGOs and advocacy groups into the heart of something like the HSC and their and, and government policy making. That's very that's beyond concerning. That's pernicious. I think there were a number of things in Don Lachey's um, interview with the Irish Independent which were quite interesting. The first is where he's talking about um, a new role that the HSE is putting in place which he believes is designed to put uh, to enshrine an activist-based model of care, uh, an affirmative model of care. Then there was the point he made about a former manager with Tenai 
recommending patients uh, to a Belgian clinic for treatment. Yes, referring to the clinic in Ant- uh, the Antwerp clinic rather than clinicians. Yes, that I think. And the other one, which I don't think has been much mentioned, is that O'Shea, uh, during the interview, said that he expected to be silenced and sanctioned by the HSE for uh, and that they would ask him to leave his position as the as the national lead on obesity for speaking out on this. Yes. So, bit of a concern when one of the top medical uh, professionals in the country comes out and says this is a significant issue. There are absolutely concerns here. It's not suited to children. It's going to hurt people. And then says, "Oh, and by the way, I expect the health organisation to seek my resignation because I've told you this." Yeah, that's. Frankly, it's not a it's not a great line. That's scary. I mean, that's actually scary shit. That's wrong. That's just deeply wrong. And even if he's wrong, the fact that he feels that is indicative of an environment and a climate and a context which is bad, just bad. And again, the the point he's making about the the former Tenai managers that person is not a clinician, and yet they will be involved in the referring of people to a, a children to a clinic. And that that is perhaps a concern. Now, he talks as well uh, briefly about the HSE and that he feels that there is an ideology at certain levels of the HSE in support of this change. Now, the HSE and the Department of Health, a couple of people in them, they've never, I don't think they've ever been publicly named for their involvement in this because it's, it's very difficult to pin down exactly what a civil servant has done. You get people who'll tell you, but it's, very, very difficult to get people to go on the record with this. So you end up in a position where you end up often in journalism, where you know that certain things have happened and that certain people have done them, but you don't have enough to report without being certain that that person cannot sue you or that you made some factual error because, you know, the the one or two people you've talked to, you have a, a minimum number of sources generally for something. And when you're using anonymous people, that number goes up. Whereas if people are willing to put their name on something, you can get out with fewer sources basically because you know the bar is lower because you can go well this doctor told me this or this you know, manager told me this as opposed to it just happened but i have consistently heard from people that certain named people and there aren't that many of them but they're very well placed inside the hse and the department of health are largely individually responsible for the integration of the transgender charities and ngos into the hse and the adoption of these models um and it kind of reminds me of, of Stalin's path to power in the, um, the the Soviet party. Oftentimes, people in positions, those positions have levels of influence in certain areas that most people don't realize, even if they don't seem to be on the face of them terribly important. And then you can use those to push certain things. And that's what seems to have happened in part here. Uh, now, there is, I think, a bit of a concern growing in the department um, and the HSE that this is going to end with a lot of people getting sued, uh, both as an organisation and probably individually. Gary, is it not a little bit sad that to the extent that there is something of a metanoia, something of a heart change occurring within the department, it's not been driven by people sitting down and making some kind of rational evaluation of the evidence or indeed a desire to do the best thing for the, clin- for, the, for the patient, the best thing for the children. It's been driven by, it would appear at the moment anyway, from some conversations we've had, a concern about them being sued. Now, I'm happy that there's any kind of a change happening at all, you know, Ben Venga. But the fact that it, only, is that the only thing that happens in Ireland now? That the only reason anything changes is because people say, fuck, we might be sued. I mean, it's a large part of it and, and a concern that when people start getting sued, someone is going to start getting access to documents oh, and your name yeah, is going yeah, to start yeah. appearing on things. That's true. Yes, I'd forgotten that. That's a, a, part, a big part of that it. That is a real concern. And Michael, I, that might be a relevant concern to have because I'm sure at some point, Michael, some disreputable people will start introducing uh, those who have perhaps detransitioned or people who know a lot of those who have detransitioned to specialists in medical legal work. <laughs> I, You know what? That may be happening as we speak. And I'm sure that will end very poorly for all involved, apart from the uh, the uh, 
barristers. For all those who have been following our reporting from El Salvador and President Bukalele, who has been doing such a tremendous job, we can we, we the, the news Gary has hit that the El Salvador has now declined from being the most murderous country in the world to being the least murderous country in the Western Hemisphere. Um, now, this admittedly, the, the 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 lowest number happened towards the end of February, when Bukalele sometime I think it may have been timed perfectly, like half three in the morning, tweeted out that the murder rate in in, in El Salvador had now declined below that of Canada, which is pretty impressive. But whichever way you put it. I mean, it, when it, the, looking at the numbers coming up, that was back in February, but looking at the numbers uh, for September, uh, you have a rate which is down, it's, I don't know if it's quite look at it, but it's down to a rate of, I think, it was 1.8 murders per 100,000 inhabitants which was, at the time, lower than Clarkana's. The reason I want to just mention this in passing was a curious thing. When I went to try and root around about, because, you know, people say things. Even in El Salvador, sometimes people say, governments say things, Gary, that may not be 100% true, you know? So I wasn't sure. And I went to have a look at the numbers, and there's an odd thing. There is absolutely no way you can deny that the homicide rate in El Salvador has collapsed. Uh, it's down to 0 0.41 per day or two, and now at the end, towards the end of the year, 2.3 murders per 100,000 inhabitants. They went 183 days without a murder. And do you remember what the numbers were, Gary, we were talking about, we talked about this first? Like back in 2015, they were on something like, was it 15 murders a day at one stage? It was uh, at one stage. It was up to it was over fourteen a day. I mean, it was just crazy numbers. It, it peaked in two thousand and fifteen with a daily homicide. The daily homicide rate was eighteen point two. This year they managed to go one hundred eighty three days without a murder. Now the furious thing. Now the way this has been achieved has been through certainly the weakening and the suspension of some of the rights guaranteed to criminal criminal uh, accused in Salvadoran law and Salvadoran constitution, but principally by building really big prisons and putting lots and lots of people in them. And if you come, if you look at a lot of the reportage from the American NGOs, from the American government and from American academia, they really don't like this. Oh, the trend started long before he came in. The, the numbers aren't really as good as they look that there's been, a, I mean, right down to, there's been a deal done between Bukalele and the, the big cartels, and it's actually all fake and it's all nonsense. But the reality is, you can't, you just can't get away from the numbers. And he's, Gallup, do you remember Gallup, the Gallup polls? I mean, the guy has an approval rating with external polling organizations between 86 and 93%. Yeah, I, I mean, some of those polls came in with approval rating that would look, you know, untrustworthy in a one-party dictatorship um i am there's a question always about the nature of government figures so for instance i mean like cuba and how good its doctors are based entirely on figures from the cuban government so i always have a bit of reticence here in relation to it but i have talked to a number of people uh who i know who are based in el salvador i am um, i have re tried to read as much on this as I can. And whatever about the, the absolute truth of the figures being put out by the government, the people I talked to said that the decline in daily crime has been absolutely dramatic. Like yes. Life-changingly yeah, yeah, dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even if the figures are, are being milked one way or the other, or there's inaccuracies, it seems to have made a real difference in the day-to-day -day of people. Now, there's talk that a lot of the gang members are still out there. There was um, a leaked report from one of the police chiefs there, I think last week, that said there were still 46,000 um, gang members free in the country. But that means they, I think that that worked out that 66% of all people thought to be associated with gangs are now in prison. And even with, even the ones who were at large, 
they're not sure if they're actually in El Salvador or whether they have actually fled to the United States. Be but the, I think the point you make about the the, the numbers is 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 absolutely on the, is right. We we can't be sure of the numbers, but we I'm far more interested, or in a sense, more convinced by the polling data, because what that tells you is that people feel massively safer. That the reality of the lives that people of the of the ordinary people of El Salvador has massively changed, and that's the reporting. And so, whatever about the particular details, we we know. And it's, as you, I think you made the point before when we were talking about this, it's not just the murder rate, that's the top level headline. But underneath that, the mass of crime that will have infected the ordinary lives of poor El Salvadorians, underneath that kind, underneath that headline figure of murder, was horrible. And it was, it was, it was crippling the country both on an individual level, uh, politically, um, both due to corruption and just the general loss of order, but it was also crippling the economy. Um, El Salvador's economy seems to be doing much better now that you can open a business without being, you know, immediately the target of violent gangs who will threaten to kill your entire family. But I, I'm not really surprised to see that the crime rate has fallen, given that they are building these prisons. They're putting massive amounts of them into it. And when we talk about prisons in Ireland and the West, Michael, we tend to focus on rehabilitation. Yes. But prisons actually have a, a number of other purposes. I mean, they have deterrence, that the idea of being put in prison might stop people from committing crimes. Now, actually, that's not really as strong as people think. If you want to deter people, you want them to be certain that they will be caught and that they will be swiftly dealt with. So prisons can play a part in that, but actually it's more of a policing matter uh, than anything else. Obviously, you have rehabilitation. You have retribution, which I think is uh, is quite good. That has two parts. One, it means that punishment is justified because someone should face retribution for their crimes. But it also, and this is an important point, lowers the crime rate by stopping the people who have had crime committed on them seeking a personal solution. Yeah, you take vendetta out of the equation. Yeah. If you feel that the person who hurt you is going to be hurt by the state, you are less likely to do that and you avoid these sprawling basically traveller feud situations where it just becomes this incredible thing that just sweeps everything into it. But the one I think we, we really tend to forget about is incapacitation. Prisons work by reducing crime, by removing people from society. Because the sort of people who commit crime, a lot of crime is committed by actually a very small cohort of people who are habitual criminals and just all around pretty awful to deal with. Mm -hmm. So you put them in prison and they can commit less crime. And then one of the strongest indications um, or that someone is going to commit crime is their age. You can basically just put people in prison until they're too old to commit most of the crimes and they're just not going to do it. It's like when people complain that um, criminals who are put in prison become better criminals because they can network and learn other things. That is true. There is a network effect there. But the other side of that is well, yes, but if you keep them in prison for long enough, it's not going to matter what they know when they get out. I, we should, for the sake of uh, Claire, it's their age and their genitals. Uh, criminals tend, tend, tend to be tend to be young, but they also tend to be male. And if you if you just take lumps of them out, but there is a fund of, and I think this is the, uh, the uh, before we finish, uh, the kind of notion I want to get at was so much of the resistance to the fact of ukulele is, I think, based on the fact that it appears, at least, to some degree, to some extent, he said, qualifying it desperately, but that simply putting large numbers of people who are committing large amounts of crime in prison for an extended period of time will actually reduce crime rates. And for a very long time now, those people who have been professionally involved in the business of crime and punishment or crime and reform are have been dedicated to the to the notion, particularly for a certain political view, that crime is caused by inequality, deprivation, alienation, that kind of stuff. And until you sort out, how many times have we heard this, the root causes, you're not going to have any impact on crime. So the fact that this guy 
doesn't look like he's going after the root causes of crime, but rather just the crime, and is having not just some of some success, but a very large degree of success, would seem to undermine that principle. And I think they re I think that's a large part of the resistance. And then we'll give them their due. There may be other people who are just genuinely concerned about the civil liberties issues, because there may be people left in the world, Gary, who are genuinely concerned about civil liberties issues, even if we don't have them in Ireland. Anyway, I think you're quite right. We have... Uh, on the civil liberties point, I would just say that there is a hierarchy of things that need to be done. And order is the very first step. On that. <laughs> if the state cannot maintain order, it can't do anything else. There's no point having beautifully enshrined human rights acts if you cannot keep order because people need to be free from the threat of violence yes but above the state comes the individual the state is there to serve the individual the individual is not to be sacrificed for the purposes of the state i michael i feel if you were to poll el salvador el salvadorians and ask would you have rather had a beautiful left-wing government which didn't declare a state of emergency and respected all of your human rights, but did nothing to deal with the gangs, or emergency law, the curtailing of civil liberties, and the likelihood that your family is going to be murdered dropping off a cliff, what would you prefer? I feel most people are going to take the latter on that one. I think that if you asked most people if hanging Michael Dwyer would succeed in bringing a significant uh, upswing in their personal happiness and their economic well-being and would reduce crime, they might be perfectly willing to vote for the hanging of Michael Dwyer. I would point out, however, that Michael Dwyer will be strongly opposed to that. And making me, and when you go to a point, Gary, where you where people become means rather than ends themselves, is very dangerous. And it's not a left-wing position. I think that would be a very right-wing position. But I am not a Hegelian. That sounds like utilitarian nonsense to me, but okay. Oh, it's the opposite of utilitarian nonsense. You're talking utilitarian nonsense. I uh, know, I know. No. I'm just fucking with you. Yes, you are. Stop it. <laughs> let, let the people go home. We shall be back next Sunday, probably. All the best. <laughs>